There are many reasons, uh, many reasons why we forget. Many reasons that events come and we may, re- we may forget special dates. We may forget birthdays, anniversaries. We may just remember anniversaries. We may just remember through moments before or the day of. And there perhaps are many reasons why this happens. Um, some people might say that, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just too busy. The busyness of life is as such that uh, I, I, I just forgot because I have so much other things going on. Others, we rely so much on reminders. I'm going to set a reminder on my calendar. I'm going to write a reminder down on a post-it note. I'm going to set an alarm for this. That we rely so much on reminders that, well, we may forget to set a reminder. Others with the reasons why we may be forgetful, um, well, we might just say that we are forgetful people. We might just say that, oh, I don't have a, I don't have a good memory. How many have ever said that, by the way? Like, oh, I, I, I'm, I'm bad with remembering details. I'm bad with remembering names or dates. Many hands go up. Almost seems, you know, we, we meet someone and say, oh, I'm, I'm going to apologize ahead of time if I forget your name. I'm, I'm really bad at remembering names, dates, events. Isn't it as such that if we don't intentionally remember something, we're in danger of forgetting? I, of course, uh, don't speak of this experientially. I just speak of this uh, theoretically. Because, you know, I can't remember the last time I forgot something. (laughs) Turn in your Bibles to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4. You also have your, uh, your notes this morning. Um, I would encourage you to to fill those out, to um, go right along with the message. There are three points or three exhortations here that we're going to look at from from this text, and you'll just be able to follow right along there uh, in your notes. Let's read this together. Shall we stand for the reading of God's holy word? Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I am teaching you to perform, in order that you may live and go and take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I commanded you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord has done. In the case of Baal Peor, for all the men who followed Baal Peor, the Lord your God has destroyed them from among you. But you, who held fast to the Lord your God, are alive today, every one of you. See, I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do thus in the land where you are entering to possess it. So, keep and do them. For that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of these people who will hear all the statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God whenever we call on him? Or what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law which I am setting before you today? Only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things which your eyes have seen and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, but make them known to your sons and grandsons. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. One of the uh, first things that we might observe here in this passage, I'd really encourage you to, to follow along there in your notes. There's a, the front and back. The front is where you'll be writing things down. The back, there's uh, just some questions perhaps to ponder after the service or, or throughout the week. Um, one of the 
One of the things that's just important to know in, in the context of this, there's a short little paragraph there at the top of that blue sheet of paper that just explains this is Moses' encouragement, this is his proclamation that we see uh, all through these first several chapters of Deuteronomy uh, to remind the people as they're going to be entering into this promised land that God is giving them that they would indeed be diligent in, in faithfully remembering God's laws and keeping God's laws and passing those things down to the next generation. Moses himself understanding that he would not be entering into the promised land with them. So he's giving them this, this important reminder, this encouragement, that he's saying, as you go and I won't, remember this. And yet, as, as we... As we see some of these words, I, I want us to understand a, a few distinctions that perhaps as English readers reading an English translation of, of Scripture, we might not otherwise catch. Alicia just turned uh, five years old on Friday, and I'm sure, you know, other, other parents of, of older kids and grandkids, uh, you'll be able to tell me um, that this this behavior doesn't go much farther than five years old. Um, <laughs> why do you laugh? Uh, um, Alicia's learned that we can ask her to do something, and she's equated the word listening to I hear you. And this doesn't last much further than five years old, right? So the, she, she hears something, we ask her, Alicia, would you please do this? And she says, yes. And I say, Alicia, are you listening? She says, yes. Fully convinced that, yes, indeed, I, I heard you not making quite the connection that, will you hear me? Will you please go do what I ask? Oh, yes, yes, yes. So I, I fully anticipate by six or seven, we're not going to have this problem um, <laughs> at all. Your laughter is not encouraging. <laughs> Shema. Shema. It's a word that as we look at the Old Testament, specifically as you look at Deuteronomy, it's a word that we ought to know well, a Hebrew word, that when we see here in chapter 4, actually, and we see this in, in chapter 6, which that the beginning prayer in chapter 6, which is called the Shema, um, but it's this, it's this Hebrew word that not only means to listen, to hear, to allow your ears to receive a, a communication, but the word Shema is directly tied to listening and doing. You have, you have some blanks to fill in there. It's to hear and to act. These words were not distinguished. These words were not, were not separated in the Hebrew language. When you, when you use the word listen, Israel, when you said Shema, Israel, you were communicating hear this and act upon it. There would have been no misunderstanding for the, the Hebrew listener when they heard this word Shema. Maybe for us, you know, we hear, okay, I, I, I listen to a good uh, message on the radio. I listen to a, a good sermon. I read this book, and my mind is filled with this new information. And I've heard some good stories. That's not the, that's not the, context of this passage. Here, even in this first verse where Moses is communicating, he says, and now, O Israel, listen. It's not simply, hear me. It's not simply just, oh, recall for the sake of nostalgia these things. When he says, listen to the word of God, listen and obey. Listen and obey. Before we even move on from this, the uh, late John Mitchell is, is remembered as saying, oh, perhaps as often as he stood in front of people to preach, don't you folks ever read your Bible? And I've, I've talked to people who have seen or who had seen uh, Mitchell preach and they would say, you always have his Bible and his notes up on the pulpit, up on the podium. And though he had scripture there and his notes and such, and he'd talk about reading God's word and he'd talk about knowing God's word, 
I'd heard from people who had, who had seen him preach, who had heard him preach, and they say, you know what, Mitchell, he never looked down at his, at his Bible. And it's not because he wasn't referencing it. It's not because he, he, he wasn't preaching from, from the word. But most people say he just had a, a manner about him that he knew God's word so faithfully and so diligently. He had, the, he had scripture there open, but he didn't need to glance down. And he'd get up in front of people and say, don't you ever read your Bible? Don't you folks ever read your Bible? As we think about Moses' encouragement, first and foremost, before we go through the, the other aspects, the other kind of functional and practical things here, I don't want to move on too quickly without emphasizing to you, followers of Jesus, read your Bible. Read, diligently study God's word. Don't rely, by the way, don't rely just on hearing a sermon on Sunday mornings. Don't rely on just gathering together once a week and hearing just a, a short passage. I thoroughly enjoy going to Costco. Perhaps some in here do for various reasons. Perhaps some in here don't. They can be kind of busy in there sometimes. I thoroughly enjoy going to Costco because I thoroughly enjoy those free samples. <laughs> you go around, and I only go through just the, the particular thing once. Sometimes if it's something that Shelly doesn't like, we'll both get one and she'll give one to me, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> we'll go through and you know, they'll have little samples of things. And it, it's, I don't know what it is, if it's, if it's just because it's a very small portion or, or they make it really well, but those, they're just so good. And I, I say this, I say this because while those are enjoyable, while that's, it's fun to go walk around, do your purchasing, do your shopping, and get some free samples, that's not going to sustain you. That's not going to fill your body we would know this about our, our, our physical selves. We would know this about our physical bodies. My, my physical body, my nourishment, can't come from free samples at Costco. Well, they'd kick me out. It can't come from free samples at Costco. And your spiritual nourishment can't just come from morsels once a week. So again, I encourage you, Battleground Baptist Church, read your Bibles. Listen to God's word in his sacred text. Shema, listen, and what? Do. When you see this word, understand, this last uh, fill in the blank here, when you see this word, the understanding is as you're, as you're encountering God, you're not, you're not debating going, well, okay, God, I'll, I'll take this into opinion, it's I will listen and do. That's the, that's the essence of this word here, Shema. Now the second point, first point was to listen to God's word. The second point that we see observed here in this text occurs a number of times. And it's this other word that we see. You see it in verses 2, 4, 6, and 9. Look at what he says. You shall not add to the word which I'm commanding you, nor take away from it that you may keep that you may keep the commandments of the Lord, your God. And we see this word keep in form four times in this short little passage, four times in this discourse. So, so he, he's communicating to Israel, Shema, listen, and do. But there's also this sense where he's saying, keep, remain. And there's, there's a couple of... Well, there's a couple of ways that would be helpful for us to understand this. In one sense, if we, if we hear something and we commit to doing it, keeping commandments is this idea that we're perpetuating in the obedience. Uh, Francis Chan uh, would use this example. I, I, I enjoy uh, listening to some sermons by uh, Francis Chan sometimes, and he, he would share this example. This is his, not mine. Um, but he would say, you know, of, of his kids, if his kids went to him and said, you know, Dad, we, we, we heard you when you said to go clean our rooms. We heard you when you said that, and, you know, we, we thought long and hard about it. We meditated on your words of we should clean our rooms. You know what we did, Dad? We even got our friends together. 
we got our friends together and we went upstairs and we just sat around in a circle and talked about what you meant by that. <laughs> what you meant by, by us, by you saying we should clean our rooms. We thought about it, we, we, we meditated on it, and Dad, I'll tell you what else. We memorized. We memorized that you said we ought to clean our rooms. Is that what he means? No. There's a listen, there's a do, but there's a keep in obedience to diligently remain. I would, I would mention this of this word. And by the way, these ideas are so linked. This Hebrew word for listen, right? Shema, this Hebrew word for keep, to remain, to stay, in this context is shamar. So the shema, listen and do, shamar, keep, remain, diligently. It's not passive. It's not this hope of if I'm here, I will, I will remain here. That I can just, I can plant my feet in God's word. I can, I can develop this, this habit of I'm going to read my Bible and I know that tomorrow it'll just happen naturally. My obedience to God because, because I've given my life to Jesus, because I call myself a follower of Jesus, this is just going to occur naturally now. That's not what's entailed in this idea of keeping and remaining. There's this intention in Shamar. To diligently remain is not passive, but rather it is very, very active. This, this second point in here under keep is to actively guard. Actively guard. This other definition as, as we unpack that word, this other implication that we can get from this, to actively guard. As you're listening to other inputs, as you're listening to other sources of information, news, media, neighbors, culture, society, other books, other readings, newspapers, and such, as you're getting this information, Parents, grandparents, kids, teachers. As you're getting this information, we are to guard Scripture. We are to guard God's Word. That is to say, we have God's commands. We have what God calls holy. We have what God calls good. We understand what God calls sin. And when something comes up in the world or, or, or in culture or any of those other sources that begins to argue with what God says is good and what with God says is sin, we guard what God says in our hearts. That, that means that we are not influenced when the world begins to say that something that God says is sin is not sin. To keep, to shamar, is to actively guard the truth of God's word in our hearts. To not allow the, this wrong message to infiltrate what God's word says. When God says something that is truth and anything that contradicts God's word is not truth. And it's not to be added. God's word doesn't need to be supplemented seasoned with, with, oh, you know, I, I know God's word says this is sin, but those are, those are only in, in certain circumstances. Well, times have changed. Well, yeah, you know what? Times have changed, but our God has not, and his word has not either. Amen. To keep God's word is to diligently remain and to actively guard in our minds, lest we be deceived. This other thing um, that I'd put in here, and this is perhaps even this third line, is, is a way to rephrase for some that would have this better way of understanding this. To keep is to faithfully persevere. To keep, to keep is to faithfully persevere. And I like the word perseverance in the definition of shamar because it it to me communicates and implies intense opposition. That maintaining a stance, that maintaining a posture is not only intentional, is not only important that I need to keep it on the forefront of my mind in guarding, but it's anticipating the waves. 
It's anticipating that ebb and flow back. The picture I get of this is almost you're on a boat and you're trying to maintain uh, a posture. I'm not a big fan of water, so I'll say you're on a train and you're trying to maintain a posture. And say you weren't holding on to the handrail. Say you weren't holding on. When that train gets going, you, you're, you're forced, you're pushed to move in a certain direction. To faithfully persevere is, yes, in the midst of that motion, in the midst of the, the ebb and the flow, you're holding on faithfully and steadfast, persevering through opposition, through persecution, to what? God's holy word. We see this a number of times in the passage. Let's look again. In verse 3, by the way, there's this reference, and um, it's always helpful to understand where something is being referenced when we, when we look at Scripture, when we're in told or encouraged to remember something. Look at verse 3. Your eyes have seen, he's talking to the people, your eyes have seen what the Lord has done. In the case of Baal Peor, for all the men who followed Baal Peor, the Lord your God has destroyed them from among you. Well, if you know your Old Testament, in, in Numbers 31, we see this story of, of some of these people, actually 23,000 people, we see later uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians uh, make a commentary and make a reference of this, 23,000 people go and engage in, in the conduct of Baal Peor, which was, which was sexual indulgence, which was um, lewd things with, with children and just all of these evil and wicked things. And some of these people in Israel started to participate and engage with this culture. They didn't remain steadfast in God's word. And they're destroyed. 23,000 people. And he's bringing this sober reminder, your eyes saw what God did in the case of those people who went astray. But, look at this notion again, look at, the, look at the shamar, but you who held fast, you who kept diligently, actively, faithfully, you're alive today, every one of you. I encourage you, listen to God's word, keep God's word. And the third point is this, make known God's word. Make known God's word. I'm going to pause even here for just a moment. Maybe when, maybe when you see this idea to, to make known God's word, maybe for some, um, a thought comes to, your, to, to mind, well, that's the pastor's job. Well, that's the preacher's job. I'm not a preacher. I'm not a, I, you know, I'm not a pastor. I, I'm, not, I'm not good with words. I, I, I leave that to the person. I don't do public speaking. So this, this, part, this part doesn't so much apply to me. Maybe for some, that's the initial impression here. It's the responsibility of every Christ follower not to be good public speakers or anything of the sort, but to make known God's word in your social context. If that's your best friend, if that's your neighbor, if that's your children, if that's your parents, if that's your sibling, if that's your boss, you're gonna make known the gospel. But I wanna take this even just a bit more personally and focused because of how it's communicated here in this text. Fast forward here to verse nine. We read the, we read the passage, but I wanna look here specifically at verse nine. He says this, only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently. There's that keep again. There's that shamar. Keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things which your eyes have seen. We talked about that. If we are not diligent, we forget. By the way, how tragic is that? How tragic is it that we can forget the faithfulness of God? Don't believe me? Has God proven to be faithful in a circumstance in your life? Raise your hand. Many hands went up. God's proven to be faithful in a circumstance in your life. When that circumstance passes and the next circumstance come, comes up, how many of us have panicked? Do we forget God's faithfulness? Do, are, are we convinced that, well, that was, that was a one-time thing. God just happened to be glancing over, notice me, intervene, but then God moved on. 
And for some reason, we convince ourselves that God is no longer faithful, that God is no longer active, that he's no longer involved, that he's no longer sovereign, that he's no longer almighty, that he can't handle this new thing that I'm going through. It's wrong. Why do we forget this? Because we don't diligently remain. We don't actively, we don't actively remember and guard. Don't forget the faithfulness of your God. Am I saying write it down? Sure, yes, write it down. You put reminders on your calendar and on your cell phones to, to feed your dog of all things. <laughs> you can write down in a journal of God's blessings the times that he's been faithful in your life. First and foremost, by the way, if you're a follower of Jesus, then you already understand that God has been faithful to reconcile you to himself without you. That through the finished work of Jesus Christ and his work alone, you are forgiven of sin and reconciled to God. So if you think to yourself, okay, I'll start a journal, so the first time God does something in my life, I'll do it, but he hasn't done anything yet, look again. God has already proven faithful. And if you haven't started a journal, the first thing that ought to go in is your salvation. That you are saved by faith alone in the finished work of Jesus alone, not by your works, lest we would find a way to boast and make that about ourselves. Okay, back to verse nine. Lest you forget the things which your eyes have seen and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, but, look what he says, make them known to your sons and your grandsons. Battleground. Read God's word. Keep God's word. And make known God's word. Make known to your families. Sit down and read scripture together. Sit down and study God's word together. Sit down with your children and say, let me tell you a story about God's faithfulness. Let me tell you a story from scripture about God's faithfulness. Let me tell you a story from my life about God's faithfulness. Parents, if your kids are old enough to understand, meaning they're not, oh, say, two, <laughs> if your kids or your grandkids are old enough to understand and really grasp Tell them the story of your salvation. Tell them the story of, of how God's providentially provided to those who raised their hands, which was near everyone. I said, how many have, have seen God proven faithful in a circumstance of their life? And whoop, just about every hand went up. Tell your kids. They need to hear it. Grandparents. Oh, you have even more stories. Tell your grandkids. I was sharing with the, uh, the youth about six weeks ago as I was looking at this passage. I had told the youth upstairs, in about six weeks, I'm gonna be challenging and encouraging your parents and your grandparents to tell, to tell you stories about God's faithfulness. And my challenge to them was, just be quiet and listen. Just take it in, give, give your focus, give your attention. Put down the phones, put down the distractions, and really pay attention to that which is being communicated to you. Make record of the faithfulness of God. How beautiful and wondrous it would be for parents, even now, it's not too late to start. Keep a book, keep a journal of all the ways God has been faithful in your life and someday, give that to your kids. Give that to your grandkids. And they'll have this, this document, this book of all the ways mom, dad, grandpa, and grandma have been firsthand witnesses of the hand of God. Listen, keep, and make known God's word. Tell the story of your testimony. Tell stories of God's providential faithfulness. How did we start? We started with this idea this morning. We're so quick to forget. 
We're so quick to hear things and not follow through. I'll do that when. Shema, Battleground Baptist Church. Listen and do. Apply that indeed it would go well with you all the days of your life. Let's pray together. Father God, blessed Son, most Holy Spirit, as we look at Scripture, your holy, living, active, and powerful word. We praise you and thank you that you are still sovereign. You are still almighty. You are still alive and well and unchanging. And the same God who has been faithful as recorded in scripture is the same God that has been faithful in our salvation, is the same God that is faithful in our present circumstance, and is the same God who will continue to be faithful to his people who are called by his name. And we praise your holy name. God, we confess that we are not as diligent in the faithful studying of your holy scriptures as we ought to be. God, help us. Help us to learn. Help us to be students of your word. Help us to listen and do. Help us to keep and persevere. And God, help us to make known the wonders of your faithfulness, to make known your salvation, the finished work of Jesus, among the nations, among our neighborhoods, among our own families. And I would just pray for your blessing on this local gathering of your people as represented in Battleground Baptist Church. Father, would you be well pleased to bless them and keep them, to make your face shine upon them and be gracious to them. You lift up your countenance before them and give them peace.